first of all, a look at what's happening in different e-commerce markets. If you look at a market like China, for example, you can see it shooting past the US in terms of a total market size. And you'll often hear in a market like Brazil, well, our market here will never flourish because we never had a catalog culture here. Well, if you look at a market like China in that size, that's another market that has absolutely taken off uh, despite the fact that they never had a catalog culture. There have been a confluence of a few different factors that have led that market to really explode. Likewise, if you look at a market like uh, the UK, you can see it's much larger than Germany, despite the fact that the German economy is actually larger than the British economy. Again, a variety of different factors that caused uh, e-commerce in the UK to explode. And actually, the percentage of retail that's sold online, or retail sales that are online in the UK, is significantly higher than what we have in the US. Partially, that's driven by a large uh, online grocery market that, was, that is responsible for about 20% of that total market. But overall, it's just a much more digitally enabled marketplace in the UK as compared to pretty much any other market around the globe. And if you look at Brazil here, um, you see that in terms of Latin America, it absolutely dominates. It is a significant market. Um, it is continuing to grow at a rapid pace. I sometimes get asked you know, why growth rates here are slowing, and the only reason they're slowing is because just it, you know, it's a market that is still immature, but it is maturing a bit. It's a large market, so it's no longer going to grow at 50% you know, year on year. We still do see Brazil, uh, or e-commerce in Brazil, growing at roughly 20% you know, year on year at this point. You know, by contrast, some of these other markets, Argentina, Mexico, much smaller in comparison. In, in the case of Mexico, a much earlier stage market. Sorry, keep on hitting the wrong button. All right, so let's talk about China for a minute. Um, this is arguably the market that um, has set a whole new precedent for e-commerce around the world. It is a market that was extremely small just a few years ago. And today, as you saw, it's racing, uh, it's over $300 billion, and it is racing forward um, toward being a $600 billion market. So what's, what's different about e-commerce in China? Well, first of all, it is a massive market. It is absolutely huge. Um, it is larger than the US, larger than many other markets combined today, and it continues to charge forward. It used to be that it was only a market uh, that was concentrated in the big cities, but today in, Brazil, in uh, China, you'll see that every part of the country is starting to buy online. You also see market dominance by a single player. In China, the market is much more concentrated than what you see in almost any other part of the world. Tmall responsible for between 40 and 50% of all uh, online sales within the market, within the B2C market. Taobao being responsible for between 80 and 90% of total sales uh, within China. So much greater market concentration than you see anywhere else. Um, when you look at what's happening in logistics, it's just a, a massive investment that's also going into logistics in that country. You see billions and billions of dollars being invested by companies like Alibaba, by companies like Jingdong, that are now building out their end-to-end -end solutions to be able to deliver to customers across the country. Um, and in terms of uh, the players in the market, the other thing that's really unique about that marketplace is the fact that uh, there are a number of players that have helped streamline market entry within China. So you not only have you know, the big players having marketplaces where uh, you know, different brands can launch their sites, you also have players like Baozun and Yuke's that provide these full service solutions to brands looking to enter the Chinese market today. And in fact, we'll talk about this in a minute, but this is one area where I feel like the players in Brazil have in fact not really capitalized on the opportunity where there are significant places where you can play a greater role in bringing some of the brands to Brazil. Let's look at India for a minute. Tiny market, a really small market, still just a couple billion dollars. If you look at what's happening though, you see incredible investment going into India today. You've got hundreds of billions of dollars going into some of the leading players within India. They are you know, small players making you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars, not making billions, in many cases losing a lot of money, 
yet the investment going into India for the size is unlike anything that you see elsewhere in the world. Yes, there are huge amounts going into a Brazil or into China as well, but given this market size, it really is unprecedented. You also see traditional retailers playing a very small role in India today. This is uh, one component of the market that makes it quite different than what's happening here in Brazil. The big retailers in India have barely launched e-commerce, the ones that even have. Many of them are still developing their e-commerce offerings. It's also a closed market for many retailers. If you are a Walmart, if you are an Amazon, you cannot enter uh, India with a traditional online retail model. You can operate a marketplace in the country, but you cannot own your own inventory uh, as a multi-brand retailer and sell it within India today. Uh, there is a chance that may change, but right now it means that the local players have a very strong footing in the marketplace, and the other players that come into the market can, can compete as a marketplace you know, by uh, providing services to sellers, but they can't actually compete with their traditional business models. Now, if you're a monobrand retailer, you can. If you're a Chanel or a Nike, you can sell online in India, but so far uh, only a handful of companies have gone that route because of the overall market size. And then finally, because of some of these issues, the marketplaces absolutely dominate uh, in this market today. But with that has come some customer service challenges as well. Keeping your customers satisfied as you go from owning your own inventory and being able to control the experience to now relying on a variety of different sellers to satisfy your customers. So some of the big players in that market have really started to uh, address the customer satisfaction challenges in the way that they haven't in the past. Now, Russia. One of the things about Russia that's quite different is the fact that you have this incredibly fragmented retail environment. No player in Russia has more than five, uh, four or five percent market share. So that makes it quite different than almost any other place in which you have you know, a dominant player. Uh, you know, in many markets, a dominant player might have 20, 25 percent of the market. As we saw in China, it's quite different. Russia is still very open in terms of the competition and in terms of who is really going to dominate that marketplace. There also is a huge cross-border e-commerce market, uh, e market in Russia today. But as in India, you're starting to see that market um, becoming more protectionist. So today, companies like DHL, like FedEx, have now had to stop delivering to consumers in Russia because um, the government has stepped in and said, you know, we have far too many imports coming into our country. We need the Russian retailers to be able to, you know, to thrive in this market. So we're not necessarily going to allow the cross-border players to thrive and to take advantage of our market today. Um, other countries that have huge cross-border e-commerce markets include places like Canada and Australia. But in those cases, there are, in fact, some incentives uh, for consumers to shop online as compared to in Russia, where they're simply making it harder and harder. Also, a variety of different pickup uh, locations in Russia. We have uh, seen in Brazil that there's still a, this dominant model of delivering to the home. In markets like Japan, you've seen the convenience store delivery model. In Russia, you see a lot of these lockers, for example, uh, being offered to consumers to be able to pick up their products if they aren't at home during the day. Um, you go in, you put in your payment if you want, you then can pick up the package at this actual location. This has become a very popular way uh, of collecting packages and also to allow them to avoid some of the delivery hurdles that exist when consumers are unavailable during the day. And then finally, this is sort of an interesting example. Um, some of the retailers in Russia, as in China, have started uh, having the delivery person stay at your door while you're actually receiving your delivery, generally an apparel delivery. And you can try on the product and decide if you want to keep it or not. In the uh, case of Russia, what some of these couriers do will be to provide fashion advice. So they will tell you whether that dress looks good on you, whether you should keep that pair of shoes, whether it goes with the pair of pants that you're wearing or not. And so it's an interesting kind of innovative approach to retail in a market that, as we saw, is you know, very competitive, a lot of different players, and a lot of these uh, big guys in the apparel space trying to figure out a way to compete, trying to do something that maybe not everyone would be able to do, particularly maybe not someone doing uh, cross-border into Russia. So an interesting competitive approach to that market. So what are the takeaways from what's happened in these brick markets? Um, first of all, in markets like China, 
there are all these solution providers that have uh, you know, come into place that have helped streamline market entry for brands. There's far less of that here in Brazil. I know there are a lot of players that are providing different pieces of the solution to, uh, to brands looking to enter Brazil, but there's not a full service solution to the degree that there is in the US, that there is in Europe, and that, that there is in China. And in China, they realized brands are very anxious to figure out how do we get into this market that seems incredibly complex with us for us, and we don't have the ability to figure out all these different pieces on our own. We just want someone to manage the logistics for us. They want, we want someone to help us build a website that will speak to Chinese consumers. We want someone to understand yeah, and help us do marketing in the country and to figure out what customer care channels to support. In Brazil, to my uh, knowledge to date, there's no one player that does this that a brand can offload all of his or her, uh, uh, brand manager can offload all of his or her services to within Brazil. And it is a market that continues to, uh, to challenge brands. Yeah. And so I feel like there's an opportunity for a number of different players to help step into this market and to say, we can help you figure out Brazil. Um, another trend you're seeing in Brazil today is a shift to marketplaces. Um, and in this case, I mean traditional retailers starting to offer marketplaces on their e-commerce sites. But one of the things to understand is that once you start to launch these marketplaces, from the uh, retailers in India, you've seen that customer satisfaction can potentially be impacted by this. And you need to be able to prepare to tackle these issues and to be able to uh, make sure that you are uh, working with your sellers to create an experience that's, you know, uh, that's on brand, that does not in any way make them uh, fail to trust your brand and to take, it, you know, take away from your traditional offerings. So you really do need to pre be prepared as a retailer if you're thinking about launching a marketplace. And then finally, the, po the point about the online retailers in Russia who have uh, launched these services, you know, the logistics services to consumers that allow someone to, you know, to, uh, to wait while you try on. I'm not saying that should be replicated here, but you have to start thinking about how are you going to differentiate your services. Uh, one of the issues you always hear about in Brazil is the fact that so many of the retailers are offering you know, free uh, overnight or you know, two-day delivery to the major metropolitan areas. But what can you do beyond that? We know that's a challenging uh, business model to sustain long term. What could you do differently, if not this, thinking about how do you use that fulfillment piece to really differentiate your offerings? So I want to talk for a minute now about what's happening globally. Um, what are some of the things that you see in every market around the world? Because there's a tendency in Brazil, I think, to look to the US, maybe to look to some of the European countries for what's happening. But in fact, there are a lot of things that you can learn from happening around the globe and things you need to understand um, will impact your business. The first is the challenge of profitability. In every emerging market around the globe, it's very hard to create a profitable e-commerce business. We've seen this in India, we've seen this here, and the companies that are profitable make the headlines because it is so challenging, and it is not something that happens within one to two years. When we ask businesses about how quickly they expect to see a return on their investment in a new international market, it tends to be one to two years, which almost never happens. Um, even in the, you know, the developed e-commerce e markets of the UK or the US, it's hard to get payback in that time frame. So realizing just how long it's going to take you to reach profitability is absolutely essential. Essential for your budget planning, essential for your resource planning. Um, and this is not going to change in the near future. There are a lot of options to bring down the costs, but you still need to be here for the long term. Other thing that's happening around the globe that we also see here is this shift to the tier two, tier three cities and the smaller towns in terms of e-commerce growth. So in every big emerging market, whether it's Russia or China or Brazil, you tend to see initial growth coming from the tier one cities, coming from the big cities. But with time that starts to give way because the product selection tends to be more limited 
in these smaller cities. You don't tend to have the same access to brands in those markets that you do elsewhere. Um, and the online channel becomes a way to reach them. So if your business is primarily focused on urban consumers in the big cities, understand that you may be missing out on some of the opportunities in those smaller markets. Other thing uh, is obviously mobile. You, you can't talk about e-commerce today without talking about mobile. But um, today it's you know, happening in both emerging and uh, developed e-commerce markets. Mobile is in many ways the primary driver of new e-commerce sales around the globe. And this is not just smartphones, this is tablets as well. It is not the dominant way yet that consumers shop online, but for new consumers who are coming online for the first time, for shoppers that are increasing their spending, a huge amount is being driven by mobile. Other thing, uh, how markets develop tends to be very similar around the globe. You almost always see consumers first coming online to you know, engage in, you know, today it's social media, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago it's used email and chat and things of that nature. Then they start to make some digital purchases online. They may start moving money around online. So they may start to make a travel purchase. That tends to be one of the first purchases made in a new market. So until recently in India, between 80 and 90% of all purchases online were travel. Once they've become more familiar with those uh, particular areas, you know, online banking as well, trusting their bank and uh, being willing to move money around between accounts, for example, only then do you get to physical purchases being made online. And here you tend to start with comparable goods like consumer electronics, like uh, books and media, computer hardware. In almost every early stage market, these are the categories that dominate. And finally, at the end, you get to the subjective purchases. You get to the purchases that, are, you know, that require a heavy touch and feel component to them, whether it's apparel or beauty, um, grocery. And you hear in every market, this will not happen here. Uh, we have too much of a touch and feel culture. We have too much of a, a traditional retail shopping culture for these categories to shift online. But they do. They do in every market around the globe. We heard this in France you know, five or ten years ago, that France was much uh, too focused on the fashion industry and shopping was much too ingrained in their culture for it to shift online. Uh, but in fact, now apparel is a huge percentage of online sales in France. And if you look at where countries are on the spectrum today, you'll see that the overwhelming majority uh, of the markets in Europe, in the US, have moved already into phase four. Brazil is getting there. Brazil is still very much dominated by the early stage categories, by consumer electronics, uh, large appliances, uh, being sold online, computer hardware, but it's, the market is inching over toward that far right column where you will see everything being purchased online. And grocery is a tricky one. Um, grocery in the US is a tiny market, for example. As I mentioned before, it's huge in the UK. Um, it will take a lot longer for something like grocery to shift online as compared to apparel. But over time, you'll see apparel here representing 15 to 20 percent of all online retail sales, just as it does in the U.S., in the U.K., and other big markets. So what does this mean for Brazilian online retailers? Um, first is, if you are a brand just coming into the Brazilian market today, Realize that it's not going to take you one to two years in order to reach profitability. As I have mentioned in the first part of this, it takes many years and it is a challenge and you need to be thinking about how you're going to get there. Um, it is a market like the other uh, big emerging economies where it is going to take many years. Finally, prepare for growth uh, from the smaller markets. As we saw in the earlier slide, many of the new sales that you're likely to get will come from those smaller cities. And if you look at a market like India today, you see that close to half of all of the sales of the big players, like a, a Flipkart or a Snap deal, are coming from those smaller cities. And many retailers here have said the same thing. That's where they're seeing many, much of their growth. And make sure that you're positioned to take advantage of mobile. Mobile is not uh, an initiative that is a one-time deal. It's not, we're going to launch our mobile app, we're going to launch our mobile site, and at that point we can exhale and move on. 
it is a constantly uh, iterative process where you start taking advantage of, uh, of new opportunities in the marketplace, of new functionality of mobile devices, move to having something much more contextual. In the US now, there's a lot of uh, work being done by traditional retailers around the use of mobile devices in store. So understanding who is in your store, where they are in the store, uh, and even what prices to offer them in the store. B&Q, which is a UK uh, retailer, is offering dynamic pricing in their store. So if you are a loyal customer and you go close to a product, you're going to be offered a different price than someone who might not shop there as frequently. Now, it's a trial. Um, it's early stages, but they said it's been quite effective to date. So again, almost uh, you know, taking a lesson from the travel industry here and understanding that you want to reward your most loyal customers, not just in terms of the overall experience, but even going as far as being, uh, going to your prices themselves. And then finally, understand where your products fall in the e-commerce adoption curve. If you are an apparel retailer here in Brazil, it's not that there won't be a huge opportunity here, but you may need to work hard to convince consumers to buy online. It's not like uh, buying a, you know, a smartphone online or a laptop. It's a very different experience. And particularly in a market where there has been uh, an issue around sizing consistency, you're going to have to work even harder to overcome some of these issues and to push consumers into this last category where they will start making purchases uh, of that category online. Now, what is different about Brazil? We've talked a lot about what is the same in Brazil as compared to in other parts of the world, but there are some things that are very different here. First of all, there's never been a cash on delivery culture here in Brazil. Obviously, there are the boletos that are offered on a variety of websites, but the you know, sending a courier to the customer's door and having that courier collect money from the customer that they then bring back is something that happens in virtually every other you know, big emerging e-commerce market around the globe, whether that is China or India or Mexico or Southeast Asia or the Middle East. In these places, close to 50% of all purchases are made through cash on delivery, particularly in the early stages of the market. And while this may seem like a good thing for Brazil, um, there are actually certain things that COD can do for a market that can help accelerate it. And overcoming the trust issue is possibly the biggest one. Consumers will start to buy online once they trust that they're gonna have a good experience, that they're actually going to get the product that they ordered online, and cash on delivery can help them get there. Um, also in this market, you do not see online retailers owning delivery networks the same way they do elsewhere. And there obviously have been some investments, particularly recently, uh, in this area. But if you look at markets like India, like China, like Russia, the leading online retailers own um, the fulfillment piece. So if you order from Ozone chance in Russia, chances are they will use their own network to deliver to you, certainly if you live in one of the big cities. They might use the Russian post for the last mile in the most remote parts of the country, but for the majority of orders, they will use their own. Likewise, in India, a Flipkart, which is you know, one of the top sites there, a Yihaojian in China, a Jingdong. We saw before Alibaba is investing in its own network. So this is a trend that has not happened to the same degree in Brazil to date. But again, we're starting to see those same investments. And this is one that I think is also interesting about Brazil. You always hear about Brazilians being social online. You always hear about it's either the number two or number three country for Facebook, depending on where India falls at any given time. You hear about the number of Twitter users and how long consumers spend on these social networks in Brazil. But in fact, that's not the most interesting piece. The most interesting piece for brands is how consumers interact with those brands on social networks. They are far more likely to want to be associated with brands uh, on Facebook, on Twitter. It's part of their identity online here in a way that in the US and even more in Europe has not happened. We, do, you know, we obviously use the social networks extensively, but consumers still largely use them for communication you know, with friends and family as opposed to having any brand connection through the network. So this is a very different situation here than what you've seen in some other markets. 
Another thing that's quite different about Brazil as compared to its uh, particularly emerging market counterparts is the fact that traditional retailers here play a very strong role in e-commerce. So just to explain what's on here for a minute, the light blue here are web only online retailers. They have no affiliation with any traditional retailer. You know, maybe they have a, a partnership or you know, a small partnership or something. Um, but in China, in India, it is those web only players that absolutely dominate in these marketplaces today. We saw in China that Tmall has 40, 50% of the the B2C market, the next biggest players are players like Jingdong and Yihaodian and Vankel, which is a apparel site, all web-only players. Likewise in India, none of the traditional retailers have offerings that are at all like what the web-only players provide. In the US and in Brazil, that's very different. And what this means is that um, the opportunities for omni-channel offerings today are much greater in Brazil than they are in some of these other countries. In China, there's really just Suning, is the only major retailer with any significant omni-channel offerings in that marketplace today. Here, once the retailers start getting very sophisticated in terms of their offerings, whether it's in-store returns, in-store pickup, ship from store is a huge uh, trend in the US market right now, sending those products directly from your retail stores to consumers. Those trends, once they hit here, will almost have the snowball effect in which you'll start seeing a large number of retailers doing it. And we saw this in a market like Australia, where the retailers, traditional retailers, were reluctant to invest in omnichannel, but once they did, it came very quickly, and consumers' expectations changed quickly. And they did in the US as well. In the UK, they offered a wide variety of omni-channel services before we had them in the US. And we were, people thought, well, it'll take years and years. Once they started, it was a matter of a year or two before consumer expectations in the US really started to shift. And you expected a retailer to offer you in-store returns. You expected a retailer to be able to um, offer in-store pickup. You expected a, you know, uh, your products to be delivered quickly from one of the stores, from one of the warehouses that didn't matter but you expected all of these things within a short time frame. And that's what you really are likely to see here in Brazil with, I know, a number of initiatives underway. I know the retailers are starting to get there, but still being early days, but huge opportunities given the strong role that traditional retailers play in this market. And if anyone's interested in the categorization here, I did include both uh, B2W and Novo.com as traditional retailers because of the alignment between those e-commerce sites and a traditional retail chain. I know the digital division is operated separately, but for the intent and purposes of this slide, they have an alignment with a traditional retailer and are starting to invest in some of these services. So, Takeaway for online retailers in Brazil, and I'm coming up against my mark here, so. Um, first of all, you don't have to deal with uh, cash on delivery, which is a good thing in that return rates are incredibly high on COD orders. And simply the, uh, the refusal rates, people not being home, saying they don't want the product once it arrives, you know, in some cases 30, 40% with cash on delivery. But it does allay consumer fears. And that's still an issue, particularly in some of those smaller cities that you're getting to with online sales in Brazil. Consumers there need to be convinced of the, the value of buying online, and they need to be convinced of the integrity of the retailer they're buying from. Without COD, you have to take a little additional step to make consumers feel like it is a trusted retailer and they are going to get the products they delivered in good shape and in a short time frame. Next, online retailers that do not and do not plan to have any sort of an investment in a logistics network or tend to operate one themselves are going to have to work much more closely with their logistics partners um, than perhaps they have in other countries because they don't own that piece. They don't have the ability to completely control it. So, as I mentioned with you know, La Moda and Ozone and some of those others in Russia, Part of the reason they can do these creative things is the fact that the couriers are their own, the networks are their own. To, in order to do something like that in a US, you know, in, uh, where we have a similar situation in Brazil in which the, the retailers do not tend to own delivery networks, it's the same thing. So you're gonna need that very close partnership 
uh, with the logistics players in the market to talk about what can you do creatively? What can be done that's different from what's being done today? Next, social networks present a different opportunity here. Um, so for some of the global brands that we work with in the US, there's a certain level of convincing them that it is different here. Um, and that it, again, is more than just the number of users or the intensity of usage of social networks. It is the nature uh, of that interaction, of the way that consumers are interacting and affiliating with brands here that's very different than it is in the US. Huh. And then finally, omni-channel initiatives, while still relatively nascent uh, in Brazil today, are going to soon change the shopping experience. And it will change the experience for consumers, so their expectations will shift, and it will change the economics for retailers also. I mentioned ship from store, which is a huge trend in the US today. That's not based on the store that might be closest to that consumer. In many cases, this is um, driven by the price that that product will be sold at uh, in a particular store. So if I am Macy's and I have a, an order coming from a customer in New York, I don't necessarily ship to them in New York. If that shirt would sell for $50 in New York, but $20 in Dallas, Texas, I'm gonna ship it to them from Dallas, Texas, from that store, because I'm gonna make a lot more money off of it from a consumer who's made that online purchase than if I pulled from the closest store, where chances are I would sell that product at a quite a high price point. So the algorithms are becoming very sophisticated and are helping these retailers' bottom lines. And in a way that we haven't seen many other um, logistics developments have an impact, this absolutely is. The ship from store is, as far as the big retailers are concerned, one of the greatest things that they have come upon in a long time. So this is another big impact of these uh, traditional retailers playing a role in this marketplace today. Something like ship from store can have a fundamental impact on uh, their bottom line, on their business model, as well as changing the expectations of consumers. And with that, in 22 seconds left, I will uh, take questions. Zia Wigler, ladies and gentlemen, thank you.